That was a very inspiring episode, wasn't it, to hear Alex Morton. Like, you can't help but listen to her and be engaged, be inspired and want to take action. I would challenge even the most slovenly, even the, the, the laziest couch potato who has an iota of care or passion about the Atlantic salmon, not to be moved or motivated by, by Alex Morton, possibly the queen of activists. It was, you know, you know me, I'm a bit of a glass half empty, I hate to say it. You're one of those couch potatoes, that's why you want to tell me. No, no, me. not couch potatoes, <laughs> glass half empty. <laughs> but yes, I don't get out as much as you do in terms of activism, Jim, but <laughs> you're an inspiration. Touché, <laughs> touché. <laughs> but I have to say, when you, we were doing the interview, when you listen back to the, to the podcast with her, you just want to go, oh, I have to do something, what can I do? And the way Alex sees herself just as much as a, as a grandmother as she does a global activist, it just underpins how humble and effective and inspirational she is. Yeah, no, it's incredible. And, and now she's moving on, going back to the Wales, which is a great story in itself, which I'm sure we'll follow mm. with great interest. But this side of the water, Jim, for this week's episode, had to save the salmon in Scotland. We have two strong Scottish voices, advocates for the Atlantic salmon. On one side of the fence, we have scientist Dr. Colin Bull, who has done fantastic work so far with the Missing Salmon Alliance in being the architect, really, of the um, Likely Suspects framework. And on the other side, who do we have, Dara? We have got Robert Mitchell, who is Gilly on the Spay and a man with an absolute lifetime experience of working on the Spay, gillying on the Spay, seeing so many people catch salmon. His uncle used to be a gilly going back. So it's a multi-generational insight and history he gives us. But he also talks about what it's like current day as well. Um, I have asked him, um, I put a request in, could he beam live from his ghillie hut? Because the salmon season is now open. So I'm hoping that we're going to get him live from the river bank. Who knows? Well, I want to do a show from there. <laughs> I want to do a show from there. You can, you can run the show. I'll be in the river. Call me or I'll call you when I call one. Have you ever done your TV show up there? We did. We did an episode or, or a section of an episode on the River Spay there on the Tolkien Beat, which is a stunning one of many jewels that is on that incredible river. Um, and from memory, yeah, I think I caught a fish. Um, I think I was the only one, but yeah, I caught a fish. It was great. It's a beautiful place. Let's hear from Robert Mitchell. I said to my rods this morning, it's a sporting wind, we call it, so enjoy it. But it's quite windy, so <laughs> some interesting casting techniques this morning. So, so just for the listeners, uh, you are a ghillie on the famous Macallan Beat on the River Spey, beautiful stretch of water. Uh, in the past, a very productive stretch of water and hopefully will be this season. You've been on the riverbank, haven't you, uh, between yourself and your father for as long as you can remember? Yeah, I've been on the river now 30 years as a ghillie on the Spey myself. And my my father's uncle, he was he was a ghillie down in the lower spate, rough the second way after the Second World War. So it's sort of in the in the family, you could say. Um, but my my father's always enjoyed salmon fishing. But yeah, I've seen I've seen some big changes in my time from an abundance of fish and a different way of fishing to present now. You know, you can there is a there has been a huge transformation. Obviously, Scotland um, is absolutely synonymous in the angling world with salmon angling. It's, it's where it arguably came from, the Atlantic salmon angling. It's a huge part of the Scottish, her Scottish heritage, a huge part of, of your culture, isn't it? And listening to you just now, obviously, it's multi-generational. I can imagine conversations around the dinner table with you all discussing nothing but salmon and those that aren't interested in or weren't interested in the salmon around that table getting very upset and very bored very quickly. Um, if it's anything like my my dinner table, but actually, with regards to Scotland, just just paint a little picture for us, if you can, about how ingrained salmon angling and the, and th therefore the sa the salmon itself, the Atlantic salmon, is in the Scottish culture. It's it's, it's obviously a huge uh, importance, you know, to communities, to valleys, to villages, to to the people. You know, um, it, it, it creates a, a, a living, you know, um, for everyone. There's so many spin-offs, as we all know, because of, because of salmon fishing and what it provides. 
so it's 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 a very important fish to have. You know, everybody fears the day that it's no longer existing, and some people sense that day coming sooner rather than later. When you speak to just just local shopkeepers, you know, people that generally don't even fish are worried about you know not seeing that fish in the river anymore. And I'm sure that's a great sense of feeling across Scotland at the moment, across the UK, you know, across across Europe, it seems to be. Um, and it doesn't matter where or which culture you talk to, everybody's very concerned and worried about it. And I think it's important that everybody just gets behind everything, you know, gets behind the worry of it and, and play a part in trying to improve the runs of salmon again. The days of, you know, catching lots of fish are gone, but like just how prevalent was it? How much fish were being caught? Like um, It was. I, I definitely experienced that when I started in the early 90s. So I saw, I, I witnessed that before catch and release was really com- coming in about. So I was at the tail of that trend where, you know, there was 30, 40 fish a week, sometimes the big grills run. So there was 80 fish a week being caught for per beat, you know, eight, six rods this was. Uh, everything was in the fish lab. You were bagging the fish up and they were away to the smokehouse and, you know, everybody, everybody was drinking tea or pepe and the drinks basket was out and, you know, the, the dog had a whole ham uh, to itself in them days, the back of the Range Rover. So it was <laughs> lovely. It was just a lovely way. And, and everybody enjoyed it, you know. Um, Looking back, it was just a, a great thing. And there was so many fish. When I started, th- there was a gilly that I was working under and he had already done 30, 40 years on the river. And I always remember him saying that, that oh, there's no other fish around that there should be. So so he had seen a decline, you know, and, and he was talking. Of course, me back then, in my eyes, I was going, what is he talking about? There's so many fish. But for him, there, there wasn't a lot in his eyes. So it's interesting how every sort of decade through the years that um, different vintage, you know, different vintage of gillies have seen trends and decline, decline, decline. You know, from the 60s, the 70s, they talk about a decline back then. As with, I would have said, really? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it should have been here a hundred years ago, isn't it, Jim? Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a, it's an inbuilt. It seems it's an inbuilt sort of opener for for any gilly that I, that I've uh, had the pleasure of fishing with. It's it's all oh, you know, it's terrible. It used to be. It used to be so much better. But the sad truth is 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 is, is there is a lot of truth to that. Uh, and just listening to you uh, and the multi generational gilly thing, and there's a lot of you on the spay, and, and indeed up in Scotland that 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 sort of have, have been handed the baton from their father or their uncle or whatever. So you really are um, part of that tapestry. Uh, is your is there a concern, Robert? Um, I know the role of the gilly has changed somewhat and and has has progressed a lot. I mean, gilly just if you Google Google the word gilly, it means surf, doesn't it? It means subordinate to to, to, to the lair, yeah. basically. Um, thankfully, that's changed, and gillies, you know, in my experience of salmon fishing in Scotland, are the, are the most invaluable people that there are, and you you can't be fishing without a gilly, really. Uh, and they are the eyes and ears of the river, and they pass that on to to, to the angler, and and in, in, vital to the experience. What is your concern? Um, because I know you're adapting. All of you are adapting very quickly and brilliantly to 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 try and field this huge decline in numbers. How do you see, where do you see yourselves going um, if if the numbers continue to fall? Well, I think it's every gilly's fear in Scotland that there is a point that there is no salmon. And we're at a point of slow numbers where they can't sustain themselves for me to reproduce, that you fear for the future that one season and whichever river it may happen to, that all of a sudden there is nothing returned. That cycle has come to an end. It's completely declined. That's that's the fear factor. When you when you speak to to people, you know that's their biggest fear that there is no more fish. And I I think we're at a stage in some some cases where 
Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's you, you think it's not it's, it's not far away. Um, numbers are so small and and so little, and maybe less of a pedigree rivers that aren't well named. You know, smaller rivers that we don't know about that you know of that are local to you, and it's just a shame that you know that 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 could happen. That could happen. That yeah, it would be a very sad day um, when that comes, and you fear for the future. I think anybody has a mm. passion for the king of fish, for that, you know, that beautiful silver salmon that we all enjoy, that we all find magical to look at, that it's no longer here and in the UK waters, then, you know, what, how, how sad is that, you know? You don't want that to happen on your watch. No one does, right? No. I remember a couple of years ago, I was doing a documentary on uh, the drows, you know, the first time of the season is generally landed there. I did an interview with somebody involved in salmon fishing up there and they always told a story that struck with me. It was very poignant just hearing you talk, Robert, about the demise, um, you know, and not wanting, want, not wanting to witness it or to be the person to see it happen. And they told me of a Spanish visitor who used to come into Ireland every summer and they'd come for a week or two and they'd drive up and down the western Atlantic coast and they would have his kid with him and he, he didn't go fishing but what he wanted to show his kid was Atlantic salmon in the rivers because mm -hmm. they didn't have them obviously where he was and he wanted to be able to say look that's a salmon and the person I was interviewing was saying I hope to God that is not going to be the story that we're going to be telling our grandchildren or our children to have to bring them somewhere to say whether it's Ireland, Scotland, or whatever, and having to go mm. abroad on a holiday and say, look, you see that? That's a mm. salmon. You know? Yeah. We used yeah, to have that and in it our was rivers, just yeah. such a poignant story for me. But, Robert, do you, how do you deal with, as a ghillie then, described really well in terms of what it was like, in terms of the numbers and the culture of it and the excitement and the buzz when it was, fishing was there. What's it like then when clients come nowadays? And you're having to temper expectations or are people arriving now knowing how difficult it's going to be? You know, 30 years ago, it, it was first on the list. You know, that that's how you sold fish and that's how people came to the river. Number one was to catch the salmon. And for some people, it's still, it's still there for them. But a majority and a higher percentage of the angler that comes now, it's just loyalty to, to the river, loyalty to that ghillie. They, they come for a number of years, 10, 20, 30 years. They dedicate that same week and they keep coming back, keep coming back because it's the full package. It's the whole experience. You know, it's maybe they've got to offer other things now to accommodate that um, lack of fish and give people a happier time, you know, whether it's catering or, you know, tell them all my bad jokes that I saw on Christmas crackers at the previous Christmas, you know. But it's, 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 you just yeah, you do have to work hard, you know. And 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 as every gilly knows, it's not a nine to five job. But you're you're there dedicated to look after that client that comes there and humour them and do do the best you can. But um, and and when you catch a fish, obviously it's a bonus. It's it's great, you know. And there are still magical moments to be had in the river, but they're just they're just a little bit less. Is it hard for you to even think that that you're saying catching a fish is a bonus? Thinking back to thirty yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Colin, thoughts? Listening to Robert there wax so beautifully about um, about Scotland and the heritage of salmon fishing. What are your thoughts? Uh, you're, you're a Scottish man. Yes. Tell me about your experiences. So I'm a, I'm a, a fishery scientist, but I'm also an angler. I'm one of those kind of um, crossover people that, uh, that I try to understand the situation from the two perspectives. And yeah, and I, I sympathise and empathise with Robert's um, perspective and have been fishing for salmon for upwards of 30 years as well. So I've kind of seen the, the ups and downs, uh, the changes that have gone on in rivers that I fished. Um, and I haven't had the, the luxury to, to fish in some of these fantastic areas um, like the, the Spey, for example. But, you know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the changes. And as part of what salmon means to Scotland and Scotland's communities, 
it is it is synonymous with Scotland PLC. It is it is what people come here for as much as the glens and the highlands and you know the water, the whiskey. It's part of that story, and I think we have a a real obligation to do everything we can to make sure that we are keeping that and keeping it for for my children and their children uh, in the future as as much as we can. And I I do believe that there is a future for salmon. I'm not one of the people that think it's going to go extinct. I don't think that's going to happen personally. Um, I think we have we have got a long way to go to get to that point just because of the biology of the the fish itself. That is so heartening to hear. Because uh, <laughs> I am a glass. There's so many glass half empty people. I'm one of them <laughs> that you hear. Um, so we're going to delve into that, Colin, um, in a little bit. I just want to ask you, actually, like you, you were so right. You know, it's iconic. It's the heritage. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's the Mecca. These are the words you always associate with Scotland and salmon fishing. And there is an obligation. I think you're right. You know, even the wider salmon community around the world, you know, just wants to see if S- Scotland can survive and thrive. That becomes then the beacon, I think, for the rest of uh, the salmon community around the world. Just in terms of your own fishing, like, wh- you know, where did you fish? What was, you know, was it growing up with fishing? Tell us a bit about your own background there, Colin. Yeah, so so I, I started fishing much to my father's annoyance when I was about 10 years old because he had no interest in fishing at all. He was all about cars and mechanics and things, and I just could not be bothered with that. So it was fishing and down in the river, uh, fishing for trout, local river, five pounds a year, I think it costs, something like that, and pulling in trout and eels and and just spending time in the river and getting to know it. And that really instilled a passion in me for anything to do with aquatic you know, ecology, I guess. And I spent so much of my childhood just mucking about on rivers that that started to guide my career choices and so i i took that forward uh, and maintained my fishing interests all the way through uh, to this point now um and i've you know studied um behavioral ecology i've studied salmon i've worked in fisheries positions at different organizations in scotland and also abroad and you know i've tried to kind of maintain my passion and my my enthusiasm for angling alongside what I, I'm starting to understand about the complexities of of really trying to manage that species going forwards. It's it's ro- it is really it's hard. It's a difficult place to be sometimes. And I do very much appreciate that it can be polarized and people have got a lot of experience and also opinions to to, to put into this this big debate. Great. That's that's heartening to hear, and and just just talking back to what you opened up with there, and and you have uh, you have hope uh, about about our fish, our favourite fish. Can you expand a little bit on that and tell us about the program you're involved with with regards to um, stocking or restocking the River D? My optimism really stems from the fact that I think this fish is incredibly resilient. I think it's it everything about salmon says you know wonder and adaptability and you know different strategies this fish does have an amazing ability to come back from the brink um we've done our best to try and wipe it out in the past uh we've polluted our rivers to the point where there was nothing left and yet they still come back um i think there's a, a resilience there that we need to work with and we need to acknowledge that i think our conditions that salmon are facing are dire. I think they are um, challenging, but I think we have to try and consider the fact that this fish takes a while to adapt to new conditions, but it will get there. And I do believe that there's enough capacity within the various different places salmon are at any one time in a year to allow that resilience to start to, to accommodate change. So, you know, fish don't just do one thing. They don't all go out at the same time. They don't all go to the same place. They don't spend the same amount of time doing the same thing. And I think that's a a real bonus in terms of how they can start to change in line with the climate crisis that we're facing now. So I'm I'm optimistic. I don't don't think we should be fooling ourselves into thinking that we will potentially get the numbers of fish 
that mean the same to anglers as they always have. But I'm optimistic that we will not see the complete extinction of Atlantic salmon because it just, you know, they, they, they can they can they can get through. And unless we completely wipe out the, the rivers, then there will always be a a pool of salmon somewhere to come back and keep that population going. Is the danger though, Colin, on that that the pool of salmon somewhere is going to be so far north where they're looking for the colder waters that Scotland, Ireland, United Kingdom is far gone off the path for them? I, I think that's, you know, that's a fair comment. And I think we're seeing a pattern of, of shifting north, not just of salmon, but other things too. So I think, again, looking at salmon in in concert with other things that we know are happening in the marine environment and with the, the shift in temperature related distributions, I think we've got to be mindful of that. Yeah. And I think it's it's a it's a risk, it's a possibility. But I don't think it's going to happen anytime very, very soon. Um I think it's going to be a gradual shift. And you know, we are losing populations in in the southern range of Atlantic salmon at the moment because they just can't cope with the, the conditions changing. But if sal- salmon in Scotland, it's it's a fair way for them to go really before the thermal tolerances you know, get so bad that they can't they can't bear the the water temperatures here. I think that's that's got a long way to go yet. That's interesting. Thank you, thank you, Colin. If you can then tell us about what how you're implementing that in, in your stocking strategy on the D, that would be really really interesting. I think for for the listeners. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, and so, I think it's I think it's really important to to kind of think of the terminology here as well. Um, the River D, um, save the spring program is about restoring the conditions in selected tributaries where they know that the the, the very high value um, spring salmon are spawning. So this program that we've got involved in here, and I work at the um, University of Stirling, but I also do work for the Atlantic Salmon Trust. Um, we are involved with this program now because the D River Trust and the District Salmon Fishery Board are involved in doing this this really exciting program of trying to increase and maximize the these tributary areas in terms of what they can produce. So that's the key thing is can we do something to to make these natural factories of salmon do as as you know produce as much as they can. So that's really what this is about. And I know there are people that think, oh that's not enough. It's not going to be it's going to, you know, we're we're potentially not going to do anything and there's going to be no salmon left. So to think about that as well, in concert with doing that work, there's also a, an intervention that is being made and looking at restoring the natural pool of salmon in these areas. So the word stocking is used and it's synonymous with taking fish out, holding them in hatcheries and then you know getting huge numbers of fish and pushing them back into waters. What we're doing with this is not really that. It's more along the lines of a very focused, targeted intervention where we take out um, a small number of fish that have also been in the system and have been allowed to spawn. So taking some adult fish that have spawned naturally in these systems, taking them out and holding them in captivity to protect them from what would probably be you know, a death for these fish because the re- return rate of of spawning fish is very, very low. If we can hold them in captivity and use the the husbandry and the expertise that we have as an institute down here that does this, you know, all the time and have done for thirty years in holding fish uh, and rearing them, we can protect them and get them back to a state where they could be released back into the river to add another set of eggs to that population. So it's kind of getting an extra boost of eggs into that system, but it's not stalking in the fact that we're not intervening with artificially stripping and rearing those juveniles from it. So it's still it's still working with the natural system. So that's a big part of it, is, is thinking about that. And the second part is to take some smolts. So these fish that have, again, been naturally reared in the rivers, and they've kind of, I guess I see it as, They've gone through the interview and successfully passed it because they're the ones that have survived. They've got to the stage of being a smoke. So whatever they've got in them is good stuff. So we take them, a small number of them, and again, hold them in seawater, rear them, 
might take two years, but protect them from what would happen to them in the sea. And then again, take them back to the river, release them at the point where they were taken from. And hopefully they will be able to, again, add their eggs and their reproductive effort to the natural population. So it's about conserving specific parts of the, the bigger, wider stock, but doing it sensitively. Just fill in a few gaps for me there in that process. Thanks for being so clear on that. Um, when you put those, assume, so you're taking the sea out, out of the equation, broadly speaking, aren't you? Because we know that that's the biggest uh, challenge and the, and, and the biggest threat to, to the mortality of the Atlantic salmon when they're out at sea. So uh, these smolt that you bring on, that you silver up and, and, and create these spawning mature fish, you then put in the river. Uh, I guess the hope is then that they, they spawn naturally in their reds. Um, then what happens to those fish? Do they do you, do you leave them on their journey then to become Celts and see whatever happens to them, or is the idea then to take them out? Because obviously that's the that's the that's the other side of the equation, isn't it? That that you're taking the mature fish out too. Uh, what happens then? So that's a that's a really good point, and I think um, this pro project is really building knowledge and information as to what the best practice in something like this should be. It's fairly novel. It's something that's really starting off as a bit of a pilot. And I would suggest that, you know, we wouldn't be looking at taking these fish back in to do another, mm. um, you know, intervention with them. The idea is to work very much in in association with wild processes and and give a boost. And it's a temporary boost. It's not meant to be there as a a long-term solution for the problem, but it's to try and allow us to be doing the best that we can with our, you know, our our um, equipment, our experience, and our knowledge of, of holding fish. But then not, you know, not not having hands-on all the time. It's to let nature take its course. So I think it's a light touch rather than a a heavy-handed, mob-handed. Let's let's look for a numbers uh, game here. So. I don't think we'd be taking the fish out. Got it, got it. So then might there be a concern, and, and again, some listeners might, might consider this a concern, others, as others might think it's worth the sacrifice, that those fish, because they haven't experienced life in the ocean and the challenges that faces, um, and, and they actually make it out, the lucky few make it out again, the multi-sea winters, that you, they, they become cults after, Celts after they've spawned, and then they make it back to the estuaries, and they go, where out? I've never been here before. I'm in the ocean. And, and they're not equipped as a result. Do you think that experience the first time round that we're taking away from them is, is going to have an impact on their mortality? It, it may well do, Jim. Um, it's something that I think we have to consider. And I think every strategy and everything you do has to have some compromise and some assumptions mm. and decisions taken. And that's one that I think we have to, we have to take on the chin. Mm. And I think. We are we are trying to work, as I say, with as much of the natural spawning and selection process to get the right kinds of fish and keep those kinds of fish in the system. Mm. But yes, there is an element of, you know, we are selecting for fish or we're, or we're taking away selection pressure. But I think in general, the return rate of, of previously spawned fish is so low mm. that it's going to be a very small number of fish that would potentially sure. be coming back from these anyway. Sure. Sure. Um, so yeah, it's 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 got it's a compromise in some respects, but I think it's a it's a well thought through um, limited intervention, and it's using you know hatchery practices as best we can, um, and I think that's a key thing. It's it's a tool in the toolbox. And and just on that note as well, can I ask? I know salmon are very complicated to, to, to the listeners out there that that aren't au fait with with the life cycle of an Atlantic salmon. Obviously, they can come back after different periods out at sea. That that's a grills the, the 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 younger ones that have been out there for for a season, and then you've got the multi sea winter fish. Are you um, by proxy um, deciding whether that run? adapts to become a grills run or a multi-sea winter fish, depending on how long you keep it uh, in the tank and bring it on uh, as a spawning fish before you return it to the river? And again, a really good point. I think um, we're not determining that because that's effectively determined by the genetics of the fish mm. to start with. Um, how those genetics are, are 
switched on and the the decisions to mature and um, how that comes about is very much about the environment as well and we've still got some some way to go to understand that fully but i think the fact that we're taking the fish from a population that is it is known to be a multi sea winter producing population um and that we are not you know the fish we take in have got all of that genetic capacity within them to begin with what we do and what we're holding them for is 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 quite a small part of their life considering they've already had you know as smolts they've had two years in the river mm. and as adults they've had two in the river plus two at sea mm. so they've had that selection they've had the switches for these different um they've been strategies they've been triggered happens. haven't they yeah absolutely yes yeah. so they've kind of gone through these various different you know interview processes and survived and made these switches happen and we're just in some ways just holding them in a, a protected environment to try and protect those incredibly important naturally spawned eggs that we can get from them got it colin that uh, you, you've laid it out very clearly and thank you for that um because i think there's and i know when we spoke to ken whelan about this issue as well there can be a lot of confusion in terms of stocking hatcheries ranching all these kind of terms and they kind of become a catch-all some of the criticism we've heard you know in terms of oh you mentioned stocking and this is from scientists you're a fishery scientist this is from scientists who are coming out saying you can't stock you can't do hatcheries it's going to you know, it's going to have weak fish. They're not going to survive. It's been proven not to work. So what's the counterpoint to that? I think that the the studies that I've read and the accounts of, you know, really looking into the effectiveness of traditional stocking, which is, you know, thinking about taking the whole of the system out into an artificial um, setting and stripping fish by hand and rearing the eggs and putting them out. I think the evidence is fairly clear that if you do that, the success rate is very low. Um, there's a possibility that you're going to be putting more pressure on the fish that are in these systems uh, and that it's not a solution to the problem. It can be a temporary way of, of boosting numbers after a particular event that's wiped out fish, gyrodactylus, whatever it might be. But as a long-term solution, when you look at the numbers and you look at what the the real impact of that activity on the the stock is it's not effective so we need to think around that and we need to think okay that's some lessons learned we can take parts of that and we can interact with our understanding of behavior and selection and genetics and maybe we can target that for different parts of our stock or different parts of the life cycle and that's exactly what this save the spring is trying to do it's about a conservation rather than a boosting numbers for the rod type mm. of approach so you can do that and we know it works ranching works right in some places you just need to go to the ranga or you know the delphi and see that in 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 operation but that's for a fishing you know perspective it's to keep yeah. the fish to the rod it's not for conserving atlantic salmon and i think we need to make that distinction really really clear mm. I, no and I, I totally agree with that and i've you know similarly i've spoken to uh, fishery scientists who have made that point and it was the one point that really hit kind of hit home with me when I try to understand the issue is if you want angling you can go down that hatchery stocking ranching route if you want to try and conserve the wild fish you need to do what you can in terms of the conservation route can I ask you though Colin is there a danger with science and some fishery scientists where it just becomes taboo it's like this is it this is the only way I don't want to hear you talk about stocking. I don't want to hear you talk about ranching. We are focused on the wild fish and everything else you say is going to just kill off uh, the salmon and that there's not enough um, nuance. It's too, in one way, both sides of the equation are too black and white, I think. And I think science, would you agree that one aspect of so fishery scientists are, are too black and white as well? Well, I'm not speaking for the entire population of fishery scientists here. I, I'm not going to, presume to do that but i think within any any discipline there's going to be different points of view and different experiences and potentially different motivations but i would i would be pretty surprised to think that um objective fishery scientists are saying no to all of these things um just because of previous experience and not thinking of how things adapt our techniques are changing our uh, ability to do things more sensitively and with more information is is improving 
You know, we use technology. Technology is not going to save salmon, but it's going to help us to understand what we do and make it a lot better. And I think that's that's something that fishery scientists are moving forward with. And there is the discussion now about how to use the methods and understanding to do targeted programs that could help and um, reduce declining stocks in 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 sensitive ways. But let's not let's not get sidetracked with you know the stocking is going to save things because I just I just don't think it is. I just don't think we're going to get there with that. Interesting. I mean, so so insightful. Thank you, Colin. Um, just to just to before we move on to to bring in Robert and his his views on that. So, if you're saying you don't think stocking is the silver bullet, uh, is what I'm hearing, then I'm guessing that what you think it is is a temporary measure. Then why are we doing it? It sounds like what we're doing just buying a few more years or more, you know, in the scale of things, you know, a blip. When it comes to the salmon's evolution or the or the salmon as a species, whether it's going to die out or not become endangered, you don't think it is. Yet stocking isn't going to be the silver bullet. Climate change isn't going to be reversed anytime soon. What else can we do besides stocking that that is going to help the salmon achieve what you want it to achieve? Very good point, Jim. Um, I think that we've got to consider a range of things that are going on. Stocking or anything to do with the the artificial supplementation of stocks is just a tool in a toolbox it's something we can pick and choose from we can adapt and refine and potentially consider using but it's not going to be the thing that will maintain salmon as a species i think salmon will do that themselves they will they will change and adapt in time but what we're trying to do is to give a bit more time we're trying to think of what we can do to intervene and keep that at a level that's at least acceptable. And I think there's a there's an issue here between the the expectations of the fishing community as I'm part of it. And you know, and I want to get more fish to the rod. Clearly that's what people want. Fisheries scientists want the same thing. You know, we want healthy populations that that have got a surplus for fishing. Um, that's what it's about. But we've got to think of the right methods and techniques. So habitat restoration is something you know, thinking about what we can all do to try and halt the um, the the rise in temperatures, that's something as well. We can't we can't disassociate from that. Sure. And we can use some stocking strategies in in the right place at the right time. And are you an advocate then for potentially splitting both things? So you you talk about wanting to bring the fish to the rod as we all do. Would you disassociate that as a separate challenge to to conserving the wild Atlantic salmon as a species and and go down the road of potentially carving up the rivers, the catchments, uh, and and going these are for these are for the anglers. We can stick hatcheries in here, like the rivers you've mentioned in Iceland and and Ireland and and beyond. Uh, and these rivers here are going to be purely for the conservation of of the species. There's, they're all about restoration and potentially a little, a little bit of stocking here and there uh, to give the salmon the space and and a, a little bit more extra time, shall we say, um, to, to to bring their reserves up. Is that something that you think could be the future? That's above my pay grade, Jim. To be perfectly honest with you, <laughs> I, I would love those discussions to be happening. I would love that to be happening in an informed way and for those people to get around the table and they are happening within the wild salmon strategy discussions here in scotland but i don't know how that could feasibly work i mean there's robert with you know the spay synonymous with angling with with you know the the fantastic um resources that are there but it's also a conservation river for atlantic salmon mm. you know, so you've got the two things happening hand in hand and they will always have to be that way with the scottish rivers because they have got you know they've got the, the economic, the culture, and the ecology um, that salmon are part of. So it's it's going to be a difficult one. But, but you you know, in my experience and the conversations that Dara and I have had on this podcast today, you can't. It seems that it's almost impossible to do cover both things in one river or in one catchment area. Let's take the space for just because of, of Robert's here and, and it's it, it's in the conversation at the moment. If you've got the spay, which is a traditionally a fantastic angling river and also a conservation river, the programs that are going on on there, you can't, if hatcheries are purely 
for anglers. You can't start putting, can you put hatcheries on the spay in certain areas and then still keep it for for the conservation uh, projects as well? Surely you can't mix those two things with the same genetic species. Well, I think that's the, the key here. I mean, Robert will, will will know about this as well. I mean, these fish that you have in the spay, they're although they're all called Atlantic salmon, they are. there's a lot of different types of salmon in there, I believe. You know, you've got not just the fish that come back at different ages, but they go to different places. They've got, you know, different body shapes. There's all sorts of things that go on with these fish. And they've, they've, there are subspecies within there, I think, or sub, you know, mm. types within there. And I think we need to move more towards it, managing individual parts of these big river systems much more wisely and thinking on that level rather than whole, whole catchment numbers because that's that's what the fish you know the fish are are you know you'll get gross that go to certain tributaries you'll get multi yeah. human to go into others so think that through and, and use the tools appropriately at the right scale there and we've got a lot more to play with so maybe see each river as a as having a diverse selection of of atlantic salmon species within it rather than just the one strain uh, and try and sort of figure out what they are um separate them treat them dependent on what their needs are, I guess. I, I think, I mean, the, the conservation objectives need to be thought about from that subpopulation level. And then the actions need to be geared towards those particular agreed um, objectives. And that can involve, you know, the angling community. And, you know, there's, there's a, an amazing resource there for us to collect information from the angling community as well that can mm. help move that, that whole thing forwards. So it has to go hand in hand, I think. But but I, I, I strongly believe that, you know, the future of healthy salmon populations in Scotland might not be wise to think about getting back to numbers that people want mm. or think that the angling has been in 30 years ago. And, and, you know, we've had cycles in the past. And back in 1908, people were talking about the demise of the gross populations. It's not something that's new. It's, we've had these before. Sure. It has happened. Robert, you've heard Colin there explaining thoughts on the conservation and how it can be improved. What's your thoughts on it? A, a lot of what Colin was saying, I would tend to agree with. Obviously, everybody has their own opinion and views on it. I think I think one of the, the things that we, we fail to mention a lot of the times, and maybe in modern times it's a bit more difficult, but we also have a predation problem for these fish. It's great the, the, the experiment that the D's doing the the last you know or you know this to you know the spring run to improve that and the speed doing a similar thing as well with the river Dalnane where they're gonna you know winter kelts on and bring on smalt onto adult fish so they're gonna do a similar experiment as well but you know it's all right doing this if, if we've got things that, you know. We've got things there that's potentially eating them and they're not quite making it to the sea. That's always a difficult situation to have. Hatcheries. I, I believe, I, I, I used to work up at Tilton Estate in my, my first stages of a gilly. And I was involved with two hatcheries. One when I first started, which wasn't really involved with the river, but there was a hatchery that... Uh, produced S2 smalts and they went to West Coast fish farming for the food chain. Now, I have to admit, it, it, these were quality and outstanding. Would I be lying if I said none of these ever escaped into the river? Maybe. Maybe one or two did go in the river. But we certainly saw the benefit of them coming back and they were just dynamite fish and they spawn successfully. Um, I wish people could see what I've witnessed through my eyes. You'd be fascinated. Um, I can't play it. I have, don't have any recordings of it. But what I can honestly tell you was that between two hatcheries that was then set up uh, after the millennium years, uh, sort of 05, 06, I think it was, where it was a hatchery for the River Spey, and the proprietor then on that estate wanted to play his part for the valley and help and protect stocks. And we were catching our own brood stock and then reeling them, like Colin said. I have to admit, it wasn't a great quality of a fish. So 
at that point, you start to think to yourself, we're doing more damage than good. Um, so for me, what I'm saying, the two, these two things I've witnessed in two hatchery programs, for sure, quality is way more important than, than quantity at that point when it comes to hatchery. And any hatcheries that are doing successful, I think I don't think they're, they're putting out an abundance of fish, but they're putting in a quality stock and they're seeing that benefits come back. Um, I know we hear it all the time, it, the genetics, integrity and all of that. But um, yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, I, th I think there is a place for a hatchery, but it's all the other, there's no point in having a hatchery when you've got a predation problem. And all these rivers have that. So it's, you know, there, there's a fine balance with everything, you know. Um, for sure, it was probably easier to tackle predation 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago than it is now, you know. Um, we're in, we're, everything's under view. Uh, social media is there. Everybody has a camera. You know what I'm saying? It's, mm. it's just a different environment that we're in nowadays. And everything has to be handled with kid gloves. It's such a political fish, isn't it, guys? You know, um, mm. <laughs> such a shame, a such phrase. a beautiful fish, but it's it's just so political, isn't it? That fish, that lovely salmon. We're, we're gonna we're gonna be stealing that phrase, Robert. I'm, I'm absolutely shameless to say we will be we'll be stealing that. It is a political fish. With regards to predation, it's fa it's fantastic to have somebody like yourself who who lives on the riverbank to all intents and purposes. And and you're right, predation it's never been so uh, scrutinised as as it is at, at the moment. Let's assume for a minute. Bear with me. We we go down the road and uh, of. Um, getting these pro these programs off the ground, these conservation stocking programs <clears throat> that are highly specialized and nuanced depending on on the rivers in question, the species in question, the strains in question. It's it's one of the likely suspects, isn't it? Uh, isn't it, Colin, which you, I know you've been an architecture of for the Missing Salmon Alliance. Predation is one of the likely suspects that that is a that is a challenge for the, for bringing bringing the salmon numbers back up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's you know, Robert, you're you're entirely correct. It's if it's part and parcel of what's going on, it's got a role to play. And you know, in a predation event itself can be witnessed and seen, and that's that's you know, a fish taken out of the system. But it's it's effectively a lot of different things have happened to get to that point. So maybe that fish was was in a place it shouldn't have been. Maybe the predator was um, devoid of other prey at that point. Maybe it was a slightly weakened fish because it had poor rearing conditions or lack of food. And so all of these things go into making a predation event happen. And we've got to think of it as, you know, the the suite of things that are going on, the likely suspects are in themselves potentially mechanisms that are behind why we've got a, a situation where we've got very few fish coming back from the sea. But it's it's not just the the culmination of that in the event of of the fish dying. It's how they get to that point. What what combination of things happen? You know, sand eels go down, herring go down, fish that would prey on them are finding other um, sources of food, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got we've got a way to go to get there. But we are we are making progress, and we are really trying to understand this and and think more about an ecosystem management rather than salmon management approach. Uh, and that's what I think the future lies in understanding that stuff and 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 hopefully finding the ways to 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 keep things ticking away and getting good numbers of salmon back. So to help you with that, Colin, if I gave you a billion pounds, <laughs> go on then. And we'll ask, we'll ask you, Robert. I'll ask you this as well. Uh, but Colin, start with you. If you had the billion, what would you do with it to help the plight of the Atlantic salmon? So I'm going to be a wee bit off beam with this one. I think um, I would I I would actually be quite an advocate of using that money to globally try and promote a human um, behavioural change. And I think because of the climate crisis and because of the way in which we all think we can maybe do something, but you know, we're hands in the air, we can't do anything, it's about big industry and you know, um, all that. We, we as a, a species and individuals could make a big change if we started to change the way we eat. And I think by using that money to really promote and incentivise uh, a change in the way certain cultures um have diets that are based around meat i think if we change that and had that more as a plant-based diet for people 
you could have a massive impact. And studies have shown this. You could have a, a really big impact on the amount of CO2 that's being released into the atmosphere if we had more of a plant-based diet as a, on, on mass. So I think that for salmon, strangely, could for the future have a massive impact because we as individuals can do that. And we're not beholden to industry to change um, huge infrastructure and you know energy uh, production um, shifts. So yeah, that's my slightly off beam use of the money. So so you'd use like your it. your billion to I like it to, to tackle the the climate change situation head on. And obviously, if we can if we can help with that, then you you're definitely going to make a big dent in the salmon's problems, aren't you? That's I think it's all linked. I think a lot of the things we're seeing is 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 all down to the wider scale changes and how they are being manifest at different levels in the food chain. And I think if we if we, the root cause of it is something that we can do something about, and if it's a, if it's a you know let's let's cut down our meat um, consumption, and yeah, maybe that's something that could work. But you know, yeah. slightly off beam, but I'm going to go with it anyway. Great, great <laughs> answer. And and what about you, Robert? Suddenly there's a billion pounds uh, there on the table in that wonderful Gillies hut on the Spey. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to give it to uh, save a donkey. <laughs> 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 great, great. I know that 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 three years there, I, I, you definitely all smiled when I said that. But it's a good question. A billion pounds is a lot of money, Jim. But uh, mm. God, you, you can run your your mind goes in overdrive. What to do with a billion pounds? I mean, cheapers. Where do you start? Uh, who, I mean, buy buy up the whole river so I can manage it myself. You know, take control. Uh, who knows uh, it's it's a very good question there's so many answers to that a billion pounds yeah do a runner leave the missus where, where would you like to focus on robert with it let's say you bought the spay tomorrow and and it became ro- yeah. the robert mitchell I'd like to have a go. spay I'd like to have a go at definitely what i was saying just about a, 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 a small hatchery just bit, with quality and not quantity It'd be interesting to see what would come of that and then Maybe, like I said, just playing the part on everything, cleaning it up, you know, not so much hard farming chemicals, you know, that are going onto the land, insect habitat, so many different things. It's like, you know, it's all part of that. It's all part of these small hurdles that there are many hurdles that all have to be encountered. But it's a lovely question, a billion pounds, who knows? Right, well, we'll make it easier for you, Robert. You had no money. What do you advise people? What can they do? after listening to this, to try and help? I think we've, we're fishing harder now. We're fishing longer and harder hours. You know, it's a different type of angler. Just reduce that hours, that, that rod pressure, that lining of the water all the time. It's, it's really fish hard. Mm. Because there's less fish, just, just give them a chance just to breathe a little bit, you know. But I, I know everybody does treat them with respect, you know, um, all over all over the river system but it, I, I would just yeah i think we should just just not pound them as much as as as, as, we're, as we're seeing uh up and down the river you know covid times there's nobody allowed out nobody was fishing and it was like almost stepping back in time you know and, and my house is right on the riverside so you, you you can just walk out the door look over and you could see the, the benefits from that as well, you know, not not human impact, you know, on, on Mother Nature completely, you know, birds nesting three times instead of once and things like that. You could really see a difference that year. Um, and mm. then, of course, everybody had rich spoils when they did come to the river, you know. That's interesting to hear a ghillie say that as well. Thank you for your honesty there. You know, d- d- don't fish as intensively. Let, let these fish... Breathe, give them a bit more space, give them more time to rest. Thank you. That's that's really good of you to say that, Robert. Colin? That's a good point, Robert, and I would, uh, I would echo that as well. I think it's good to release that pressure a little bit. I would actually, um, with no money, I would suggest that people keep up the pressure on the campaigns to try and clean up our waterways in terms of pressure on water companies, pressure on regulators to try and um, really put Put the, the frighteners on people that are still putting these um, and allowing pollution to go into our waters because there is no excuse for it now. We have the technology, we have the ability to stop that. And I think that is just a, it's a horrible, ugly 
part of um, what we're trying to deal with. And so it doesn't cost people to lobby and to to put the pressure on. But I think politically that would be a, a, a good thing for salmon, uh, certainly in the UK. Uh, and yeah, we, we've, we've got to keep that going. And as Alex Morton said in uh, the episode we did with her, she says, activism is great for your mental health. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sticking it to but the yeah. man it always feels good, doesn't it? Definitely. But yeah, it's, it's just one of those things that I, I just, uh, it, I, I'm staggered by the stories and the things that you see going out there and it's still happening. So it just, just shouldn't happen anymore. Can agree more. Final question. Final question to you, Robert, first. It's your last day on earth. But the rivers are full. It's like 20, well, they're not full, but it's 2020. You know, they're, they're a fish you're going to catch. Where would you go and who would you go with? For me, so far in my career, all the magical moments I've had is on this river. It's been very generous to me, this river. Um, I've had some rich, spoiled moments. Um, so it would have to be this river and it would be with my father. Um, I've fished with my father all my life so far, and uh, we've had some great times. So that would that would be me right in my happy place. Love it. And w- which beat? Can I ask? Because I know the spay quite well. Which beat would you be on? You know, I, I have to say this as well. I've fished the whole river spay. Now, I've been so lucky. And I've had wonderful invites from different clients and gillies up and down the river. So I have fished the whole river. Now, I, I really mean this when I say this. There's not a bad bit on this river Mm. the whole river is a beautiful majestic classic fly fishing river um and it is one of the greats around europe is the spay for me and i've fished a lot i've fished in norway i've been to the alta and i've done it all but this river really for me can can stand out i'm not saying it's the best or it's the number one but i have to be honest it is it, it does just have something a little bit more majestic and magical than others. Uh, for me, I've had some great moments in my time here at McAllen, but I would have to say if I could fish, I think I think Tulkin D beat when I worked on Tulkin D beat. Great uh, beat. Them wood pools, the wood pools were very famous. You can dig into a lot of old books and McCorkadale's time and you know his 40 pounders that he was catching in in the in the day. Uh, I would say that I think I think that's mm. the right height mid May. Them wood pools, yeah, treasure special Henry. place, isn't it? Phenomenal, special yeah, place. Very, very, very exciting. Yeah, I can I can vouch for that. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, Robert, uh, and yourself, Colin. Sorry, I'm in a dream state now after that description. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I want to be there. I'm <laughs> looking out the window at the the dree rain, like oh, May on the spay. Yeah, that's very good. I've got kind of a dream that I would love to go to um harris and fish some of the the lochs for the the salmon there so maybe not looking at river but obviously connected um and i'd just bobbing about fishing the the dap or um just putting fish up and getting them on the surface uh when there was abundant salmon and sea trout about a day out in a you know a good breeze getting the midges away and just loving that time in a boat with a, a good pal of mine alistair and probably my boy there my uh, my son jack who's 10 taking him out too so he can see what that's about maybe he could gilly for us that's it we could get him <laughs> he could he could do the rowing and we could do the fishing and i would love a day out on somewhere like amon or something like that and seeing what that's all about and uh yeah that would be a that would be a, a dream for me thank you thank you both been brilliant chatting to you robert political fish we're copywriting that yeah if we can use that sorry mate it's ours that's, now that's the, that's the phrase <laughs> going forwards and Colin, I think you've set it out very clearly in terms of the conservation methods needed. And for me, the key word, Ed, what you said is the targeted yeah. and how science has come on, right? We know that science has improved and there's different elements now that can be used. But if it's done in a targeted way, that can make a difference, hopefully, going forwards. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and it's been, it's been really nice speaking to you guys and really appreciate it. Thank you. It's just so wonderful to have two authentic Scottish voices on our show uh, talking about the Atlantic salmon, you'd have thought every single episode would have been would have been brimming with wonderful advocates like yourself. To have you guys on and to be keeping the British end up is is fantastic, and I'm sure all the listeners will be very grateful to hear what you've had to say today. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Coming up in the next episode of the Last Salmon, we talk to Charles Clover, 
one of the leading environmental journalists of our generation and more recently founder of one of the world's most influential oceanic NGOs, the Blue Marine Foundation. I mean, I got into marine conservation because I was a salmon fisherman. I wanted to know why the salmon were returning in fewer and fewer numbers, and that's, that was from the 80s onwards. I caught a very large salmon, and the, the, the very large salmon didn't keep coming. Listen and follow on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to give us your feedback, rate, and review. We want to open up the salmon discussion to you. And keep fighting for the salmon. <laughs>